As to the first, we shall distinguish number one between a church in her infancy and growing up into reformation and an adult church which hath arrived at a higher pitch of reformation. In the former, many things may be tolerated, which may not in the latter, and therefore our fathers might have borne with many things and ministers, which we cannot, because we have been reformed from these things, which they were not. Number two, we distinguish between a church in a growing case, coming forward out of darkness and advancing in reformation, and a church declining and going back again. In the former, many things may be borne with, which in the latter are no ways to be yielded unto, as in the time of the former prelacy, many did hear prelatic men, which now we cannot do, and so in other things. Number three, we distinguish between a church in a reformed and settled state, and confirmed with the constitutions of general assemblies, and the civil sanction of acts of parliament, and a church in a broken and disturbed state. In the former, Abuses and disorders can be orderly redressed and removed by church judicatories, but not so in the latter. Wherefore, the most lawful, expedient, and conducible mean for maintaining the attained unto reformation is to be followed in the time of such confusions and disturbances, and that is, as we think, abstraction from, excuse me, abstraction and withdrawing from such disorders and ministers which we cannot otherwise get rectified. Number four. We distinguish between a reformed church enjoying her privileges and judicatories, and a reformed church denuded of her privileges and deprived of her judicatories. In the former, people are to address themselves unto church judicatories, and not withdraw from their ministers, especially for ordinary scandals, without making prior application to these. But in the latter, when ministers are really scandalous, though not judicially declared so, and duly censurable according to the word of God, and their own church's constitutions, and censures cannot be inflicted through the want of church judicatories, and yet they still persist in their offensive courses. People may do what is competent to them, and testify their sense to the justness of the censure to be inflicted, by withdrawing from such ministers, even without the presbyterial sentence. Number five, we distinguish between the ministry and the abstract, or the office itself, which is Christ's institution, and the minister is in the concrete, or the persons invested with the office. So, albeit the ministry can by no means be disowned, without the highest rebellion against God, and rejecting of man's salvation, yet such ministers that belong to the Presbyterial Church of Scotland, against whom there are solid and just exceptions according to the word of God and the acts of the general assemblies, striking against them, persisting in their courses, even unto deposition, may be withdrawn from by people who would rightfully see to the approving of themselves faithful in their station unto God. Number six, we distinguish between a faithful and a sinless ministry. The former we have ground to expect, but in no case the latter. And for the want of the former qualifications we have ground to withdraw, that is, when they are not faithful, but from none, because they are sinless. Number seven, as to what we require, we require excuse me, of unfaithful ministers before we can join with them, we distinguish between ministers condemning doctrinally and confessing privately by conference with offended brethren or resenting to them, after some more public manner, their defections and offenses, and their confessing these ecclesiastically before church judicatories and submitting to their just and equal censures. The former we judge sufficient in the present circumstances, howbeit we confess that the latter, if afterward they be called unto it, should not be refused and denied, when there shall be any judicatory to require it. Number eight, we distinguish between a separation negative, whether actively or passively considered, and a separation positive. A positive separation is when a party not only leaves communion with the church, and whereunto they were formerly joined in Christian ministerial duties, but also gathers up new distinct churches different from the former in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government. A negative passive separation is when the better part of a church, standing still and refusing to follow and concur with the backsliding part of the same church, after they have become obstinate in their declinings from former sound principles and practices, holds closely by and adheres unto what parts of reformation were graciously attained among them, separation, negative and active, respects the declining part of the church, who have deserted their faithful brethren, and after brotherly admonition, refuse to return, but hold on their new course. Hence, as for us, we absolutely deny a positive separation from the Scottish covenanted church, yea, also separation negative, if it be considered actively at the furthest. 
Herein we acknowledge a separation negative, passively considered. In our being left alone, at first in the time of our greatest straits, and forsaken by the rest, for we are endeavoring to our utmost, with many failings and much weakness, to retain and maintain, according to our station and capacity, the covenanted work of reformation of the Church of Scotland against popery, prelacy, erastianism, and sectarianism, both more refined and more gross, together with schism and defection. So we deny and altogether disown a separation from communion with this Church in her doctrine, worship, discipline, and government, as she was in her best and purest days. For we only oppose the transgressions and defections of this church, and endeavor to separate from these, while we choose to stand still, and not to go along with others in declining and offensive courses, but to follow the footsteps of such faithful ministers and professors as have gone before us witnessing in their places and stations against both tyranny and apostasy, until defections be condemned and offenses removed. As to the second, that is, what we judge insufficient in point of withdrawing from ministers and members of this covenanted church, number one, infirmities or weakness, whether natural, spiritual, or moral, are not sufficient to found a withdrawing even from ministers of this covenanted church. Natural weakness is the infirmity of parts, knowledge, courage, and the like, which infirmities are disadvantageous to them that labor under them, but in such things, if they be not altogether an inaptitude to teach or ignorance incapacitating them for the discharge of their duty, Quote, we ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, unquote, Romans 15, verse 1, under which rule ministers also must be comprehended. Spiritual weakness is the weakness of grace, faith, love, zeal, patience, and the like, as when we perceive some evidences of misbelief, coldness, security, impatience, or some rising of passion and the like, we must not cast at one another for such things, quote, but with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbear one another in love. Unquote. Ephesians 4, verse 2. Especially when such things are mourned over and wrestled against. Moral infirmities and failings are such evils as men fall into through the stress of temptation in time of persecution, Satan's suggestions, etc., being either sins of ignorance or personal escapes, not allowed, or such as the person hath been hurried into by a surprising temptation out of fear, which otherwise he durst not, nor would he have done, if he had been himself. For though we ought to reprove one another for these things, and not suffer them to lie upon our brother, yet we must not disjoin from one another upon that account, but, quote, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, when overtaken in a fault, considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted, unquote. Galatians 6, verse 1. Such being but fainting fits, lamented over, and not persisted in, nor allowed, Consequently, we must understand, not hereby scandalous omissions and commissions, done deliberately and with a high hand, or palpable and gross abominations, seeing such things coming within the compass of church censure, ought to come under another consideration, and the persons for these transgressions discountenanced, a, and while the scandal given be removed by confessing and forsaking. Number two, difference in judgment is not sufficient to found a withdrawing. If it be either in things indifferent in their own nature, which may be done or not done, after this manner or after another, without any breach of a divine precept, such things, it is true, may be made inexpedient, and may become matter of stumbling to a weak brother. Therefore in these we must be fully persuaded in our own minds, and also observe the rules of charity, careful not to offend any of Christ's little ones. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for any to do them with offense. Quote, it is good not to do anything whereby our brother stumbleth, or is offended, or made weak, unquote. Romans 14, verses 20 and 21. Or if it be in things that are not material, or not the word of patience and matter of testimony. For in such things these who are stronger and more knowing, quote, ought to receive the weak, but not to doubtful disputations, unquote. Romans 14, verse 1. Now that which follows upon the former that is, every difference in practice, according to the judgment and light of conscience, in things that are not disorderly. For though we could not allow such a thing in ourselves, yet it ought not to hinder our joining, but whereto we have already attained, quote, we ought to walk by the same rule, and mind the same thing, hoping, if in anything, any be otherwise minded. God shall reveal even this unto them, unquote. Philippians 3, verses 15 and 16. It is evident we mean not here such things as are parts of the testimony, wherein of necessity there must be some oneness in judgment and practice.